when you say, we don't have the law, we have love, I want to inform you, you don't have love. You can't have love without the law. Because law, love is the fulfillment of the law. Where is genuine love? Where is true love? Where is real love? Real love cannot be present where there is no law. Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. True love is a love which has the letter and the, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law which is love there. All right? Because what is the, what, what is the law about really? It's about relationship. R relationship with God, the first four commandments. Relationship with others, the next six commandments. It's basically relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with others. Now, if you leave out relationship and just think of it as law, then you're going wrong. Think relationship and then think about it as how to live in that relationship successfully, then you will get it right. Let me give you an example, you'll understand. Marriage example, that's the best example, right? In marriage, suppose there's a couple, they have terrible misunderstanding, they can't think alike and they can't bring their minds together, they cannot unite themselves, they have a tr trouble, problem. They are at odds, they got a problem. So they come, the elders of the family gather together and they try to fix the problem and so on. So finally, both of them say, well, write down today what I must do and write down for him what he must do. We'll simply follow that. We'll just want to follow that. Write down for him and for, him, for me. We will just follow that, she says. And he also says the same. You can write down and give it to them. Do you think it's going to work? I can guarantee you it's not going to work. Why? No writing down clear instructions is going to work because for that to work, a relationship must be strong. 
relationship must be there and they must understand that this is for a better relationship it is not just so i have kept my part have you kept your part i'm checking on you daily you know have you scored correctly on your list i'm going to check no that's not what it's about it's about, we are trying to doing this will help and develop and solidify that relationship if you look at it with that attitude that then the rules will will work out better if you leave out the relationship if you think about as my laws and his laws my rules and his rules what i am supposed to do what he is supposed to do it's never going to work out because there is no big picture you don't understand what it's all about many people do this don't understand what the law of god is all about the law of god of god is all about a life of love true love you forget that and you ignore that or you're not aware of that and then you read the law and try to do what it says you know it's you know that you will never get anywhere you know it will be so difficult to fulfill what the law says because without love you cannot fulfill the law love is the fulfillment of the law so it's very difficult all right so paul says let love be without hypocrisy i'm trying to talk about this love what this love is this love is one where there is not only the letter but the spirit is also there this love is about relationship the main picture is relationship the details you know are important but don't forget the main picture the details without the main picture will go wrong thirdly look at the word he uses the strongest word for love is used here the word agape you know we have already talked about it the, there are other words in the greek language for love for love in family among family members love among friends love between husband and wife and so on there are three different words for those things but the word agape was a new word that came as a result of jesus coming into this world and showing the love of god and then when the new testament writers began to talk about the love of god on the basis of what jesus has shown they had to use a totally new word agape the word agape meant meant divine love the love that god shows towards us the love that is unconditional the love that loved us when we were unworthy undeserving the love that loved sinners the love that loved the ungodly the love that loved the enemies of god we were enemies of god this love loved us that's the kind of love that is the divine love there is something divine about it it is superior than all these other love it's a different kind of love than what a husband and wife enjoy among themselves different kind of love from even what a parent and child enjoy among themselves different kind of love even from the love that is enjoyed between two very great friends all that love is fine but that's on a much lower level this love is far superior there is some divine wonderful quality about it and that is this love loves the unlovable undeserving in an unconditional way and totally it loves it will do anything for that person that's the kind of love now paul uses that word here when he says let love we be without hypocrisy he uses that word let agape be without hypocrisy he's not talking about any other love He's talking about agape remember in 1 corinthians chapter 13 he uh, gave a description a detailed description of this love agape love they say the reason he wrote 1 corinthians 13 is this that in his day when he was writing not many people understood what this love is nobody understood what this love is they have seen other loves uh, love in the family love among husband and wife love among friends and so on but they have never seen what is called divine love what is it he didn't want people to be confused and think that the kind of love that a mother and father show to the children is the same as divine love in some ways it may be the same but it's not actually this divine love is far superior far better than that love he doesn't want people to be confused about love he wants them to be very sure what love is that is why he uses the word agape and 1 corinthians 13 was written for that purpose he writes it he says look at the description he gives he says love suffers long 
Love is kind. Love does not envy. Now some people say, oh, all this is necessary, brother. Don't we understand all this? Well, it's because people don't understand what this love is like. That's why he's writing it. I remember when I was preaching about prayer, when I first started out, started preaching on prayer. And uh, before I preached on prayer, one uh, Sunday I told them, next week onwards I preach on prayer. So one man comes to me after the service. He says, you're going to preach on prayer? I said, yeah. He said, what in the world are you going to preach on prayer? We know how to pray. It's exactly what he said. You won't believe this. It happened right here. We know how to pray. They taught us how to pray when we were little. Four or five sentences. Every morning when I get up, I pray that. When I go to sleep, I pray that. I never do without it. We know how to pray. What are you going to preach about prayer? He said, and after six months of hearing about prayer, he came back and said, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't understand what you were talking about. There is so much in the Bible about prayer. And I never saw, the, uh, saw any truth concerning prayer in the Bible. I was just traditionally following some system, but never knew that prayer, uh, you know, there's so much about prayer taught in the Bible. Now, people are like that about love also. They say, what are you teaching about love? Don't we all know love? We know it from the cinema. We know it from the magazines. We know it from the newspaper. We know it from the television. We know it from all these places. We know love. All the romantic novels. We know love. Ask us about love. We'll tell you what love is. I know this love story. I know that love story and all that business. We think all of that is love. Paul says, no, I am talking about another kind of love that you guys don't know. That the world does not know. If you don't know Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross of Calvary, you do not know this love. Let me describe it for you. And he says, it suffers long. Love is kind, love does not envy, love does not parade itself, love is not puffed up, love does not behave rudely, love does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejo rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. See the details. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That means it never stops. It goes on and on and on. No matter what happens, it never fails. It goes on and on. He gives that description. Why? Because he believes that a lot of people don't know what it is. And it was the truth. A lot of people didn't know. Most people in the world of his time did not know what love is. Today, this chapter has become so famous. 1 Corinthians 13 has become so famous. It is so popular among Christians. But if you look at the description of divine love there, you can take that description and bring it down to chapter 12, verse 9 to 21 and insert it here. Basically, in 9 to 21 verses here in chapter 12 of Romans, he is elaborating on what he has said in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. He's saying basically the same thing, but applying it to different situations. How do you react to situations? How do you react to people? How, what do you do when things are done against you, when you're... Uh, when, uh, when they do you wrong and all of that business. He's applying it in so many ways, uh, in so many situations. All right. So let love, we looked at the word love. But then he doesn't leave it like that. He said, let love be without hypocrisy. Now, what does that mean? Let love be without hypocrisy. It means there should not be a pretense. It means... Uh, uh, in the older translations, uh, the word dissimulation is used in the New King James word, uh, version. Hypo hypocritical is used or hypocrisy is used. It must be honest in other words. It must be true love. That's why I want to call this true love. Without any artificiality in it, it's real. It's true. He says, let love be true. Let love be honest. Let, let it not be a put on. Let it not be a drama. There is no, nothing artificial. There is nothing hypocritical. There is nothing, uh, there, is nothing there that is uh, a pretense, you know. It's real. It's true. It's honest. 
So Paul says, let love be without any of these other things. Let it be pure, honest, true. Let it not be without hypocrisy. When it's a hypocritical love, you know what happens? We act like we are loving, but love is not there. Act like we are loving, but it's not there. We are fooling others that we do love. That is one aspect that we all understand that many times people act hypocritically, act like they love, they just be nice for the moment, but inside they're thinking uh, exactly the opposite, right? Uh, that uh, we all understand. But a deeper point here is this. Hypocritical love. It is one thing to fool others and make them think that you are loving them. But a more dangerous thing is involved here. That is, many people fool themselves thinking that they are loving, truly. Because they don't have this true love. But they have a mistaken notion of love. They think, I have love. I am loving. What do you mean? I love. Because they think that what they have is love. They have a wrong idea of love. So they fool themselves thinking that what they have is love. That is why it's important to know whether what you have is true love or it's a love that is hypocritical, that is not true. Love that is not genuine. There's a lot of people like that in the world today that fool themselves thinking that this is love. Let me give you one good example. This example is, a lot of people today, they think that the law of God has nothing to do with us today. That the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, and all of that has no relevance for us. It has all come to a close and end, and we just simply have to throw it out. We are un since we are under grace, the law of God has no relevance to us. We need not even look at it anymore. We must disregard it. We are under grace. The fact that we are under grace to them means that we have no relevant relationship to the law as a Christian today. Now, last week I talked about it. I explained to you what it means to be say to say we are not under the law, in what way we are not under the law. And I explained to you what it means to say that we are under grace. Don't want to go over it again. But there's a lot of people that think like that. Law? No. So what do you have now? Love, they say. We are not under the law. We are in love now. We are under grace, therefore, we don't have the law. We have love. Now, this is a classic mistaken notion about love. Because what is love, according to Paul, in chapter 13, verse 8, where we saw last week, he says, when you love your neighbor as yourself, you fulfill the law, verse 8 says. Verse 10 says, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, when you say, we don't have the law, we have love, I want to inform you, you don't have love. You can't have love without the law. Because law, love is the fulfillment of the law. Where is genuine love? Where is true love? Where is real love? Real love cannot be present where there is no law. Love is the fulfillment of the law. You cannot possibly say, I have love, I have no law. No. Because love, what is love? Love is actually fulfilling what the law says. With all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. We are loving God, we are loving our neighbor. It's fulfilling what the law says. That is what love is all about. So, to say that we have love today, we don't have law, is totally wrong, you know, absolutely wrong. Those who say that do not understand the simple truth that love is the fulfillment of the law. When you say, I love, you mean that I do what the law of God says. That's what love is all about, you know. Let me read to you some verses here. 
maybe you will understand it better. I was going to read it a little later, but I think it's better to read it now. John's Gospel, chapter 14. The first one is verse 15. Jesus speaking here. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So how do you, how does Jesus think that you love him or you should love him? By keeping the commandments, no other way. Now sure, when we come to church, we lift up our hands and we praise God, we sing, we jump up and down, we're happy, we rejoice in the Lord, everything is fine. It must be done that way. Yeah. In a way, it shows that we love God and we celebrate and we enjoy God and all that. But there's no guarantee that just because you lift up your hands and clap your hands and jump up and down and shout hallelujah, that you love God. Hello. <laughs> Suppose one person is standing like this. Come with a believing mother and father. This young boy comes and stands like this. The mother might possibly say to him, look, lift up your hands, do something. Other people will think that you don't love God, man. Come on, shout a couple of hallelujahs, lift up your hands, do something. I remember when we were very young in the old Pentecostal background, you know, uh, when we sat there without any reaction, dull, because everything was dull sometimes, you know. <laughs> so we just sat there and the pastor will say, what happened to your original love you've become cold you've lost your love i never hear any amen any hallelujah and just to satisfy him some guys here and there and some ladies here and there will shout hallelujah that means i'm not dead i'm alive i love god They want to know, everything is all right. I love God, man. You, this is the way I show I love God. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, if you love me, shout hallelujah. <laughs> it's all right to shout hallelujah. He didn't say, if you love me, sing a song and lift up your hands. It's, we lift up our hands and we love to worship God and rejoice and praise God. That's, that's part of my loving God, surely. But that is, what I'm saying is that is no guarantee that I love God. That is no guarantee that I love. There is a guaranteed way that I can know that I love God. And that is if I keep the commandments of God. That's the only guaranteed way. Otherwise, there's no guarantee. <laughs> he may or he may not love God. He's, yeah, he's jumping up and down. He's making a big noise. Yeah, he's shouting, hey man, I heard him. So he may love God. Well and good if he does, but no guarantee. What is the guarantee? The guarantee is if he keeps the commandments, then he loves God. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, don't stop with just shouting hallelujah. Don't stop with shouting amen. Don't stop, start with just jumping up and down and, and doing all that. With all that, obey my commandments. Keep my He's very definite about it. Just think about that. There is no two ways about it. There's only one way to know guaranteedly, in a guaranteed manner, whether you love God or not. That is, you keep the commandments. Is to our God. 
sing hallelujah to our God. Glory, hallelujah, is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Is to our 